All right, how's everyone doing today? <laughs> Great. <laughs> so how is everyone doing today? Yeah. All right. So this is going to be a great segue from what, uh, what Leo was talking about. So I'm, I'm going to talk about what we're here to do today and what running a startup really looks like. And running a, running a startup has its good and bad sides. We'll focus mostly on the good, but you have to get some of the bad as well. So I'll start with this question. Why is everyone here? So with a raise of hands, um, let me know if you're a builder, if you are a designer, a developer, someone who builds creative stuff. Okay. A lot of, a lot of folks, some of the other guys are, are if, if you're on the, the business end of things, marketing, sales. Okay. And you're also builders, by the way, because you're, you're building collateral. You know, I, I, I kind of look at a startup and there are three things that are key. You have to either build stuff, you have to either design stuff, you have to either market stuff, and you need all three. And so I'm happy to see there's actually a good mix of, of people in the crowd, because um, I've been in some of these events where you have only builders, and uh, that usually is a problem. So what I want to talk about is the reason that you're here is not to write lines of, it's not to write code, um, it's not to um, <clears throat> go and design pretty logos, pretty wireframes. You're not going to be judged by any one of those things. You're going to be judged on the fact that you can build or at least articulate how you're going to build a startup. And so a startup is not about any of those things, even though they're important, even though building products are important, and that's what we spend a lot of time doing in a startup. Getting all of the pieces to fit, it's, it's much like putting a jigsaw puzzle together. So getting all the pieces in the, in the business model to fit is really what a startup is about, and that is the product you're building. And so what I'm showing here is the Lean Canvas, and I, I know it's a variation on the business model canvas, and you'll get more of that tomorrow. Um, but the key point here is not to really focus in on what the individual pieces are, but that there are these nine kind of building blocks of what goes into a business plan, into a business model, and that's what this is about. So kind of to, to, to reiterate that, everything that we build, whether it is marketing collateral, whether it's design, whether it's web pages, landing pages, all of that really fits into the solution box. And I purposely, when I designed this, this version of the canvas, made that solution box really, really small because that's what we are naturally good at. That's what we can, you, you, you don't have to come here. You can actually stay home and code. You can actually go work in a cool big company. You can go in an R&D lab and build really great stuff. So that's not what we're really here about. We're here to make all the pieces fit. So it's all the other eight pieces that are on that, model, on that canvas. You want to be able to make those things fit. You want to be able to convince the judges at the end of the game that this is a model that will work. And, and, it, and to some extent, you want to validate as much of that as you can. Now, you won't be able to do all of that this weekend, so I'll try to narrow down on some things you can focus on. So this, the solution is not just the product, it's the whole business model. So now so for some bad news. So this is the, the ugly side of startups, is that most startups do fail. And, uh, and this is a number that you, know, you can argue on whether it's 9 out of 10, 10 out of 10. It's not really 10 out of 10. Some do succeed. Uh, but if it's higher or lower than that, but the point is that a lot of startups do fail. And it's not just limited to startups. A lot of products fail in general. But the more interesting number, though, is that of those that succeed, two-thirds of them report having drastically changing their plans along the way. So they, what, what they started out building um, morphed and evolved into something that was not really what they'd originally intended. So what separates the successful entrepreneurs from those that don't quite make it isn't necessarily starting with that perfect plan. And that's a kind of a key big idea to have, is that the original idea that you will have will change and you should expect it to change. And so it's not about finding that perfect plan, but more importantly, finding a plan that works before running out of resources. And so another way to look at this is that a startup is basically about risk mitigation. Whether at the end of this event, a lot of you are going to be asking questions, do I continue on or not? It's going to be based on the fact on how much risk you were able to mitigate. If you feel like you have this business model that is hugely promising, some of you will probably quit your jobs and go work on it because you feel like you have mitigated enough risk and this is actually promising. Some of you may want to get funded. An investor looks at a startup, again, as a risk calculation. Um, if you are able to have customers, if you're able to have traction, they write you a check. Otherwise, they use other metrics um, to, uh, or, or other proxies to basically balance that risk. So it might be your team, it might be your experience, it might be your domain knowledge, um, it might be how far or how much you were able to accomplish. But they use all of those proxies. But the real measure uh, for many investors is really traction. 
if you can go and show paying customers or you've got customers a path to get to them, it's an easier sell. So it's still about risk mitigation. If you're trying to get to customers, um, the same thing. Customers want to buy your product, but they don't trust you yet. And so the way that you get to them, a lot of the people in, in marketing, that's pretty much what they do, is they have to, they have to sell them on a, on a value proposition that is both compelling and one they can believe in and one that they want to buy, and particularly from you. Um, so again, that is all about risk mitigation. So everything we're gonna be talking about is systematically eliminating different forms of risk. So how do you do that? So I've written a book called Running Lean where there are 278 pages of how you go do that. And I know it's impossible to digest, so I'm gonna give you the, a condensed version of it. But there is, I have made the book available to all participants, so there is a discount code which may have gone out early on, but in case you didn't get it, you can just go to runningleanhq.com and there's an, a discount code for the Startup Weekend Brussels. So you can use that to download the book for free. All right, so Running Lean in a nutshell. So there are three, three meta principles or, or three big ideas that you can use to reduce down the uh, running lean process. So I, I mentioned early on how the product that you're building is not really your product. It is the business model that is the true product. And that's a very empowering idea, at least for me. Because when I think of the business model as a product, it allows me to really own that. So it is not something that I write to get investment. It is not something that I, you know, I create this big document and, and sell it to investors but it's something that I have to build. I don't have to just focus on the solution. I have to focus on all those other things, and there are ways we can build and test those things. And that's what a lot of what Lean Startup and Running Lean and customer development is all about. But the other big idea there is that the same techniques we use to break big problems in product development, uh, the way we tackle big problems can be applied here. So another way of looking at these meta principles is take a very big problem, like starting a startup, decompose it into its essential elements, which for me is the lean canvas. There are nine building blocks. Those are nine things to tackle. And then don't start with what is easy to do. If you are building a, a, solving a hard problem, you want to start with what's hard to do because that's, again, risk mitigation. So identify what's riskiest on the plan and then tackle those ones first and then systematically go around the plan and eventually you tackle the whole problem. So that's essentially what it is. So documenting your plan A, the reason that is important is because as entrepreneurs, we are especially gifted at building reality distortion fields around ourselves. So given any data, any information that's out there, we can convince ourselves that whatever is going on is justified and we can tweak, tweak the model in our mind and we can keep going on forever. And at some point, you, you, you find yourself running more on faith and on facts. And what we try to do with Lean Startup is bring people down to reality every so often. So there are, there are checks that you need to put on yourself to make sure that you aren't getting uh, too far in the weeds. So customer validation, going out testing ideas are things that we want to do earlier and not, not get them get too far away. So it's very important to write this stuff down. And typically business plans have been used for this. Uh, how many people here have written a business plan before? And not everyone. How many people enjoyed the process? Keep your hands if you enjoyed it. Okay, a few people did, and that's good. So business plans are, are great for the entrepreneur. Unfortunately, they don't get as much value because not everyone reads everything. So it's, it's great for the entrepreneurs to get a brain dump of what's in their mind, but the investors will ask for shorter versions of this, the executive summary or the slide deck or just a meeting with you because they, they, they don't want to read the whole document because a lot of it, to be honest, is based on fiction. They're based on things that you think will happen um, sometimes years from now, which are very hard to predict. So a much portable format is this business model, which you'll hear more about. So I'm not going to really get into, into details of what it is, but it looks kind of something like that. So let's talk about identifying the riskiest parts of the plan. So the way you do it here is you talk to your mentors. Once you have your plan A, and you don't have to use the canvas, by the way. You don't have to use business model canvas. Um, if you want to uh, just do a 10-page slide deck, that is fine. But one of the ways to identify what's riskiest, remember I said early on how entrepreneurs are especially gifted at building these reality distortion fields. And then the second part of it is that they are also especially passionate about the solutions that they're building. So if you look at a typical entrepreneur pitch, um, on their own. I think now it's changing because of some of the stuff we've been, we've been bringing up lately. But in the past, if you looked at a typical five-minute pitch, it was you know one minute on problem and then four minutes on solution. And everything else was kind of glossed over because that's what gets the entrepreneur excited. And so what we really want to do here is get out of that comfort zone again. So one way to do it is that you guys are really good at building solutions. 
but put yourself out and go validate this plan with people other than yourself. So if you can get out there and talk to customers, um, by all means, you know, you want to do that. And I'll have something at the end on how some, how some of that works. Um, more importantly, the mentors that are here, they have a lot of domain experience. Some of them have run startups uh, of their own. Um, use them, use their knowledge, because they they'll be very good in identifying what's risky on that plan, how you go test it, how they have done it in the past, and some of that may be relevant, some of it may not. And so that's where the advisor paradox comes in uh, via venture hacks. It's important to hire advisors for good advice, but don't follow it. You want to apply it. So it is still your job as the entrepreneur to build that business model that works. You can't outsource that business model to anyone. So even though an advisor might have a lot of expertise around enterprise selling, or they might be an expert on a particular domain, there are parts of that model that they may not be as good at it. And it's your job to synthesize that. So you want to complement your gaps by seeking out those kinds of advisors. And if you can't find them, then you have to go seek out customers, try to validate them. But that is part of your job, is synthesizing the information you get and making it fit into that coherent whole. So systematically testing your plan, let's talk about how you do that. So this is a little slide animation that shows the process. So when you build one of these canvases, because if you are using a canvas, because they're so simple to build, I recommend people create variations of it. Don't just start with one. So in computer science, we talk a lot about a hill climbing algorithm, which is a way to optimize a particular model. But what that doesn't let you do is find other, other alternative models that may be actually better than what you're on. So when you, when you narrow yourself down too early on problem, solution, customer, and you start testing that, weeks, months, sometimes even years can go by, and you build a product that has some use, but then it's, it has a kind of a local maximum. And there are many other more viable markets that you just fail to see because either you jumped in too early or, or, or if you had just talked to an advisor, they might have been able to help uncover that. So very early on, try to brainstorm a little bit, have a little bit of fun with the business model, don't get too tight on initially. So you, so you do want to you know, craft it down, put it down on paper, how it's going to work, but start tweaking. And what I usually try to tweak first is the customer. Sometimes a simple product, like one of the products I built was a file sharing product. And depending on who you sold it, the business model changed completely. So the pricing changed if I was trying to sell it to a consumer versus a attorney versus a uh, graphic designer. Um, versus even a game developer or a high-end high -end game developer. The pricing changed, the channels changed, everything changed about it. So it's important to kind of tweak with that and, and figure out where your optimal starting business model might be. At the same time, it's very important to go, to be focused. And don't, don't if, if you come out and say we're going to sell a product for everyone at the end, uh, at, the judging, um, at the judging time, you, you probably will, will not win if you're trying to target everyone out the gate. So once you have those kind of brainstorms done, you will probably immediately eliminate some of the models. Others you eliminate by just talking with either your team members, with your advisors, um, the mentors that are around. Um, so that's kind of a way that you narrow down. You might keep some of these models around for a while and test them in parallel. And by that I mean you might think, well, these, there are two or three of these that could work for you know, a graphic designer and an attorney, and maybe I'm going to go and run some tests. So I might call them up and I might interview them about the, this particular product. I might show it to them and see what they think. So that's a way of testing is we're putting it in front of customers in whatever form and we're getting feedback. So you might keep this for a while and then along the way you're going to run more of these experiments and eliminate some of these models. And at some point you have to get down to where you're focused on a particular model. So that has to happen. Um, there's not really a timeline. Sometimes you can run the same product under two um, on, on, under, under two customer segments, like say two landing pages. But at some point, you do have to narrow down and focus in on just one model and drive that to what we call product market fit. So that's when you have gone around the whole canvas and you have mitigated enough of the risk that you have a model that is starting to work. And after that, the next phase, of course, is then scaling that model and figuring out how we, we make the most revenue or the most money out of that particular model. So any questions so far? And I'll, I might take some questions at the end if there's, if there's time. Uh, otherwise, I'll keep moving. So another way to, um, to, to kind of say the same thing, so this is the canvas again showed out, is what we do is we identify what's riskiest, but then we go around the entire canvas in phases, and we systematically target every one of these risks. And I'm not going to go through all of this because that's a lot of stuff to do on a weekend, and there's no way you can, you can build an entire startup in a weekend. So this is what you really should be focused on for the most part. 
is, so I'm not even gonna put a, a box on the customers because that is what drives the model. So you have to figure out who your customers are. As Leo said, that is step one. And I would say even figure out who your top three customers might be because you might wanna test three initially to see if you've got really the right one. Because again, what we think is true may not actually be what's true. So, so have that broad sweep, you know, figure out who your customers are. But then the first thing you wanna do is go and test out problems. Um, you, wanna, you wanna get these customers, preferably um, they're, they're people in the room, maybe sometimes. They could be people you can find on a weekend. You can either do surveys. There are lots of ways to test, and I'm happy to go through a lot of tactics on how you can do those things. But you wanna test whether what you're trying to build is even a problem that people know they have. If you're trying to build something that they don't quite know is a problem, that's a problem for you because it's gonna be very hard to get customers after that. And so on that, there's usually a code that's often cited, the Henry Ford code, which goes something like, if I'd asked people um, what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. And a lot of people misconstru misconstrue that code to say, that's the reason why you never talk to customers because they don't know what they want, they can't tell you what they want. And that kind of misses the point because what the customers are really asking there, even though they're saying faster horses, they're talking about a problem they have, which is that their horse isn't fast enough. And so what Henry Ford was able to do is look beyond that projected solution and invent the automobile. So your job, again, is to find the solution, but you have to go looking for what customers know are problems of theirs. And you have to let them articulate it in their words, understand their worldview, and then you can, you can come up and build the best possible solution for it. Another great quote is by Steve Jobs, who says it's not the customer's job to know what they want. That's really your job. So that's what, what this is really about. And then after the problems, the next two things are channels. So how are you going to find these customers? Where do they hang out? What is your path to customers? That's, what, that's the number one killer of startups, uh, particularly web startups, after they've built something that is even maybe sometimes the right product. You can build something that's great. You can even have a small subset of users using it, loving it. But if you have no way of scaling that beyond that point, you're dead. So you have to have some channels. And if you just blindly go and list all the channels out there, like AdWords and you know, word of mouth and, and all of those things, fine. But be able to, to defend them and be able to at least do some kind of testing around them. So if you do think AdWords is a channel, run a simple test to show how well it converts. Um, there are lots of, lots of ways you can test that. And then finally, revenue streams. So you have to know how your business is going to make money. Even if you're not going to charge from day one, you have to be able to articulate how you're eventually going to make money because that's part of what makes that business model work. A business without revenue isn't much of a business. So you have to be able to articulate that. You have to be able to articulate who your customers are. And more importantly, something that you have to think about for yourselves is um, no matter what your revenue model, you have to figure out how you're going to sustain this business to get to a point where you can validate it. So I mentioned a lot of experimenting, a lot of testing going on. So you have to know how you're gonna build your runway, whether it's through sweat equity, you're gonna work like beyond the weekend, are you gonna do this you know, once, once a week on the weekends yourself? Like what, what is it that you're going to do to do it? If, you're, if you think you need to raise uh, funding, you, know, you, you need to talk about that as a group so that once the pitch is ready, you're actually aligned with that particular goal. So, so think about the runway that you want, that you need to create for yourselves um, to take this idea forward. And usually I don't, I don't like to think too far into the future. I only look into what it would take to build my minimum viable product or the first version of it, put it in front of customers and start getting some validation. Um, so what is it that will make you get there? Because once you get there, you, one of two things will happen. You, the thing will either take off, which is great, um, or it will sort of limp along, but at least at that point you have something and the learning has started and then you can gauge whether whether you, you, you actually need to get more time or what needs to happen then. But that should be your first beachhead or first milestone to get to. So just distilling those things down, um, step number one for everyone, so no matter what you build, get 10 strangers to give you feedback. And these are not people that are friends of yours, preferably they're people that you do not know, preferably they're people who, will, who are potential customers of yours. So it's not just 10 random people, but 10 potential customers. That will go a very long way not only in, in, in narrowing down the scope of your minimum viable product, but even at, on judging day, you'll be able to show some early customer validation through what you learned from that interview. The second thing is build a plausible business model. So you have to be able to communicate how this business model is going to work, and those nine building blocks are typically what go in a 10-page 10, 10 slide deck, so a lot of you should already be familiar with those. But as much as possible, it's about, again, mitigating risks, so be able to show 
what is plausible about it, what you know, what you don't know, and just be honest about it. And how more important than knowing the right answers is knowing what is risky and communicating that and having a plan to test it. It may not be something you did this weekend, but at least you know you have an action plan for how you're going to test that. And then finally, you want to sharpen your pitches. So that kind of goes without saying, but, um, but that's something that I'm, I, I expect many of you will work on. And that's it for me, so let's go build some startups.